First of all, thanks for including our paper in this uh, special session. It is great to see a lot of interest in automotive radar. Uh, my name is Pu Wang. Uh, uh, you can call me Perry from Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab in Boston. Today, I'm going to present one of our recent work on automotive radar, particularly uh, object detection using a snow time MIMO FMCW automotive radar. So if we talk about autonomous driving, uh, one of the building blocks is environmental perception to identify both stationary and dynamic uh, objects in a normally pretty challenging environment. Uh, so to have such highly reliable perception, it's likely that we're gonna have multiple sensors around the car, uh, like camera, LiDAR, radar. So if we look at the f this figure, uh, you can see each sensor has its own pros and cons. For automotive radar, it's pretty good at operating under you know, adverse weather condition, light condition. The device cost is pretty low. Um, on the other hand, if you look at angle resolution, so the automotive radar is relatively behind the LiDAR and the camera. So there are a lot of interest right now in uh, improving the angle resolution of automotive radar, but without significantly increasing the device cost as well as the uh, processing overhead. So one way to address that is using the concept of MIMO radar, which creates a um, large virtual array uh, to improve the angle resolution with a relatively small number of antennas. So for the MIMO FMCW radar, if we focus on the transmitter side, let's say we have capital M transmitters. So each transmitter will send just, you know, K FMCW pulses. So this is summarized by this equation. So what that means, we have the basic FMCW pulse, uh, just like this chirp, and then we just repeat K times. Uh, um, and then we will multiply each pulse with a slow time code, C, M, K. So let's say we look at the transmitter uh, M. So what that means, we have the basic uh, FMCW pulses, K pulses, and then we just multiply each pulse with one code defined by C, M, K. And then uh, we normally will assume that uh, we have you know, orthogonal codes for different antennas, which means if we take the inner product of the codes from different antennas, sum over, you know, the process K, we're gonna have zero. And then we will modulate the signal into the cover frequency, like 79 gigahertz, and uh, send them out. At the receiver side, uh, the receive signal, say receiver N, XNT, is just the sum of M, attenuated and delayed transmitting waveforms, SMT, but with some delay, tau, MN, from uh, M, M's transmitter to the N's receiver with some object uh, amplitudes. So then this SMT will go through the standard processing like down converting, uh, de-chirping, and uh, digital sampling at the uh, slow time and fast time for the bit signal. So, so now the bit signal, uh, for each bit, for each receiver, the bit signal is basically two-dimensional data. So if we stack all the receivers on top of each other, we're going to have this 3D data cube, snow time, fast time, and the receiver side. Now, if you look at one receiver, this two-dimensional data uh, will carry uh, both range Doppler and uh, spatial information. For the range, it basically carries the information of the range uh, velocity, I'm oh, sorry, range frequency FR over the fast time index, and then the Doppler velocity FD over the slow time index or pulse index. And then we have the spatial information FST from transfer side and FSR from the receiver side. But right now these two are not separated because the, uh, we have the weighted sum over all the transmitters. So the automotive radar normally will first get the range and the Doppler frequencies from you know, the standard range Doppler processing. Uh, for example, we have the S, F, uh, FR hat and FD hat from this range Doppler processing. And then 
we will identify a few number of detect objects. So, and then we will have the uh, angle processing or spatial processing only to those uh, detected uh, objects in the range Doppler uh, domain. So now let's say we're given this uh, Doppler estimate FD hat. Uh, so the first step is to compensate the, the original bit signal at each receiver, let's say receiver N, by removing uh, the additional slow time modulation caused by the motion of the objects, such that when we multiply the codes from different antennas, we can separate waveform. Right, that's the meaning of the orthogonal uh, codes. Uh, so that means for one receiver, we can separate capital M uh, waveforms by doing this uh, waveform separation. Oops, sorry. So if we have a perfect wave, waveform separation, and then we can, for each pair of transmit receiver, uh, we're gonna have separated uh, steam reactor for the receiver side uh, on the end, and also on the transmit side uh, on the uh, index I for the transmitter. But in the case that we have, we call a sub, sub band Doppler mismatch, that means the FD head still have some distance to the true Doppler velocity. So that means the, the compensated bit signal still have some additional um, slow time modulation over pulses domain. So then if we multiply the codes, they're not gonna be zero. So we're gonna have the, uh, we call the transmitter residual steam vector, which is just a sum of all the other transmitter steam vectors. So, but weighted by the eta term, this, this eta we call the code residual. So this code residual eta is basically a kind of an inner product, but right now, because of the do subband Doppler mismatch is non-zero. So that means the eta is not gonna be non-zero and then we will have this term, although it could be very small, uh, in the uh, a separate waveform. So our approach is to say whether if, if we take into account the presence of such residual and say, try to explore some structure information whether we can get additional gain for object detection in a, spa in a spatial domain. So now we can group all the capital M and the capital N uh, 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 separate waveforms. And if we stack them on top of each other, so we're gonna have the virtual array. So this virtual array will have uh, the object steam vector, which is a coordinator product between the transmitter, uh, transmitter and receiver steam vectors. As, as well as the resi residual steam vector, which also uh, uh, Kronecker product, uh, but with the regular receiver steam vector with a new uh, transmitter uh, residual steam vector. So each element of the residual steam vector is basically a weighted sum we talked about from the previous slide and the uh, interference pass noise. So the, the problem right now is the eta term is pretty complicated uh, and it's unknown because we don't know the uh, delta FD, the Doppler mismatch. So our idea is whether we can approximate this term with some sub subspace structure. So how can we do that? So instead of look at the unknown delta FD, let's say we know the maximum uh, Doppler mismatch, which normally is one half of the Doppler beam. So in this case, uh, we can pre-compute the eta uh, matrix, uh, uh, for in this example, we have eight by eight because we have eight transmitters. So by using, you know, a given maximum Doppler mismatch, let's say 0 0.01, then what we can see here is for all the off diagonal, which is the eta term, so you can see many of them are very small, but only a few have significant term. So our idea is we can construct a subspace basically from the, you know, pre-computed significant term in this uh, code residual matrix, and then multiply by a unknown subspace coefficient in order to approximate the true uh, transmitter residual steam vector. So from the uh, Kronecker subspace model we talked about from the previous slide, 
And we try to formulate the object detection in a spatial domain from the virtual array as a, a binary hypothesis testing problem. That means we're going to look at each transmitter receiving angle, possible angle, and then we're going to detect, we're going to determine whether there is a target on that particular angle in the spatial domain. So that means uh, for one given uh, pair of transmitter receiver stream vectors, uh, we have two hypotheses. One is H0, that means the virtual array only see the noise and difference at that particular pair of transmitter and receiver angle. Under H1, we're gonna not only see the noise or interference, but also the objects, as well as its residual uh, with the subspace structure. So to help us to deal with the clutter or interference in the background, so we also, also assume that we have homogeneous training signals from nearby uh, range cells uh, with the similar coherence matrix as in a uh, test range means. So we're going to have the estimate from the uh, sample coherence matrix from the homogeneous training signals, and then we will do the whitening on the test signal XL at that particular range beam. We get a Y, the whitened uh, signal. And then we we'll do the similar uh, whitening on the stream vector and stream subspace. So we're going to have the equivalent binary hypothesis testing problem. Given that equivalent hypothesis testing problem, we know how to deal with that. One solution is just to use the GRT. So that means we're going to look at the uh, likelihood ratio under H1 and H0, but maximize over the unknown parameters. So we'll write down the uh, likelihood function under H0 and H1. So the first step is to we try to maximize over the unknown parameter under F. Uh, H1, which is uh, amplitudes, residual subspace coefficient, and noise bars. So we say the likelihood function is kind of a compute the power of the white and signal Y, but project into a, a Kron acre subspace, which is defined by uh, a expanded transmitter stream subspace, um, HT hat. Uh, now, uh, under H0, we're going to have the uh, maximized likelihood function, which basically compute the energy of the whitening signal. And then we can show that GRT is basically takes the form of the uh, ratio of two uh, energy, energy values of the whitening signal, but projected into, uh, one is projecting, the numerator projecting into the Kronegger subspace, uh, but the other one is projecting into its uh, orthogonal complement. Uh, subspace. So now, given this uh, numerator and denominator, uh, we can show that under H0, uh, both nominator and denominator are distributed as the centralized chi square distribution with different degrees of freedom. Uh, so that means the GRT has the centralized F distribution under H0, uh, which further implies that uh, it's not a function of the uh, coordinates matrix R as well as the noise uh, variance sigma square. So that means we can have the C5 detector. So this one, we will basically we will use this distribution to found the threshold we're gonna use to test whether that particular transmit receiver angles is a target or not. On the other hand, under H1, we're gonna have the similar analysis, except that right now the numerator is a non-centralized chi-square distribution, which gives the GRT as a non-centralized uh, F distribution with the uh, non-centralized parameter lambda defined by the white and stream vector of subspace and the noise variance. So now, because the time name, I'm gonna quickly go through the simulation results. This will assume that we have eight transmitters, 16 receivers, 64 pulses. Uh, the bandwidth is two gigahertz. We have the Hadamard codes. Uh, for the coding, and we have coherence matrix by the uh, topless matrix. We define the uh, SINR or residual to interference plus noise ratio by these two equations. The first one, we're going to look at the ROC curve by fixing the SMR to the 10 dB. Uh, so we have the proper detection versus the proper force law. We compare our proposed detector denoted by the circles with the conventional detectors, which basically FFT 
uh, or kind of like standard uh, summon delay uh, field former in the spatial domain, we're looking at two values of the residual power, 10 dB and 15 dB by different colors. So right now, if you compare the circles, uh, circles with respect to the squares, that's the uh, perform performance gain we have uh, under two, S1, two residual powers. So you can see this circle uh, over the square is pretty large by explore the structure information of the subspace residual. We can also have the theoretical performance validation by compare the simulated ROC with the theoretical ROC computed from these two distributions, uh, but with different uh, residual power values. So you can see the match is relatively well. With that, I'm gonna summarize our uh, paper in a few points. Uh, so why is actually we're looking at waveform residual separation um, in the uh, Snow Town MIMO FMC interview, we developed this uh, Kronecker subsidy model and uh, also the GRT based object detector, and we have some performance analysis. With that, I'm gonna uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>